for you. Amen? Come on, we thank God that he blessed us to see another day. How many of you are thankful for that? And so we worship him this morning. You know, in today's message, this is something that ha happened in my life very recently. I don't know if anyone's ever experienced this, but have you ever read a passage in the Bible and after reading it, you're not sure what the takeaway was? You felt confused and, and, and sometimes maybe a little concerned because you say, God, what I just read was very alarming. And I'm not sure what I need to take away from this. But I need your help, Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is our comforter. He's the encourager. He's the revealer. In Greek, he's the paraclete, which means the helper. The Bible says in, in Romans that he will show us things to come. And I was driving to work and I was listening. I don't know if you guys know that the Bible app can actually read it if you're, if, if you're doing something. I was listening and following along. And after I read this chapter, I was kind of disturbed. And I said, Lord, whatever the message is, I, I didn't get it. And so I need your help. You could be very transparent with God. You can ask him for help. The Bible says in Psalms 91, call on me and I will answer you. I will be with you in trouble. I will deliver and honor you. And with long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. I said, Lord, I need your help this morning. And, and as I prayed that prayer, it's so interesting that all you got to do is just invite him in. You just got to invite him in. You, you may get it immediately, the answer to your prayer. Sometimes it may take time, but you stay in faith and continue to acknowledge God. And it was during my drive that it finally came to me. And when it finally came to me, not only was I enlightened and, and happy that he answered my prayer, I realized that this very chapter I was listening to was very relevant to what I was facing in my present situation. And so who knows? Maybe it was the enemy that didn't want me to get a hold of it. We know the parable of the scattered seed. It says some seeds fall on, on, on shallow ground. And what? The birds come and take it. Or maybe it's the lures that, that chokes the word out of you. We know the enemy doesn't want you to know who you are and whose you are. And so when you're reading the Bible, say, Lord, I need your help. I need to understand what are you saying to me about me and what I need to understand about you and what principles I need to live by so that your promises can come true in my life. Because every time you open the Bible, you see that there is promises for your life. And if you're not seeing those promises in, in, in manifest or come into fruition in your life, ask the Lord, what do I need to do differently? He'll answer you. I heard someone to say the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, is defined as basic instructions before leaving earth. There's instructions on here to help you to live the life God has for you, the one the enemy doesn't want you to have. Amen? And so this morning, this revelation that the Lord blessed me with, I'm going to share with you, and I pray that it blesses you the way it did me. Especially if you are dealing with a situation in your life where there's a particular area in your life where you feel defeated or deflated. Anybody ever just was going through a situation, and in spite of all your efforts, you just can't seem to make any progress? Anybody ever felt stagnant in one area in their life or another? That no matter what you do, you say, God, I'm, I'm trying my best here, but I don't see anything happening. Anybody ever been there before? Am I the only one who's ever said, Lord, I'm frustrated because it's been a long time, and I've been believing you, and I don't see anything happening? I pray that today blesses you if you feel stagnant in any area of your life, and that in the mighty name of Jesus, that after today you will see a breakthrough in that area. In the mighty name of Jesus, that you will be set free in that area and see that God, his faithful love endures forever. Hallelujah. You know, I was reading in the, in the book of Judges chapter 19, and I'm going to tell you in a moment to open up. It was J Judges chapter 19. This was, the, this was, the, this was the, the chapter I was listening to that kind of woke me up. And in Judges chapter 19, there was a 
a gruesome crime that was committed. When I tell you it was a terrible crime, it was a terrible crime. And I'm listening to this, and I'm like, how could this happen in Israel? This was within the 12 tribes. This was God's people. And it was in one particular tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, where this crime took place. And then it's in chapter 20 where the, the, the victims of the crime, at least the one of the survivors, came to the rest of the Israelites, all the rest of the other tribes, and told them this is what happened. Now, the Israelites that heard what happened, they were indignant. They couldn't believe that this can happen in God's, in, in God's nation. And so they decided that we're going to go ahead and seek the Lord. Now, this is where it got me. They sought the Lord for instruction and said, Lord, you heard what happened in the tribe of Benjamin. What should we do with the offenders? And the Lord says, go to war against them. So they sought the Lord for instructions. The Lord gave them instructions and said, go to war. So somebody tell me, why did they go to war and lose? Not once, but twice. The first time they prayed, I said, well, wait a minute. They prayed. Lord, you told them to go to war. How did they lose? Not only that, but the odds were in their favor. They had an army of 400,000 against an army of 26,000. That is almost 15 times the size of the enemy army. How did they lose a winning fight? What went wrong? Not only that, it was the third time that they went to war that they finally won the battle. And so the chapter ended just like that. And I said, wait, Lord, I'm missing something here. What was different the third time that allowed them to see the success when they sought you the first two times? They sought you all three times. How did they win the third time and lose the first two times? What went wrong? What am I missing here? Because maybe sometimes I'm supposed to be winning a fight that I feel like I'm losing. But maybe there's something I don't know in my approach. Amen? And so I began to pray, and I'm going to read this chapter with you before I share what the Lord shared with me. So if you have your Bibles, please open it to Judges chapter 20. I saw some of you returning there already. If you dare say amen. If you need more time, say more time, please. Sounds like you're there. So as I mentioned in chapter 19, a gruesome crime took place. They're going to reference it very briefly in chapter 20. But we can all follow along together. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Everybody ready? The title is Israel's War Against Benjamin. The Bible says, then all the Israelites were united as one man. From Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, including those from across the Jordan in the land of Gilead. The entire community assembled in the presence of the Lord at Mizpah. The leaders of, the Isra- the leaders of all the people and all the tribes of Israel 400,000 warriors armed with swords took their position in the assembly of the people of God. Word soon reached the land of Benjamin. Remember, this is where the, these were the, some, the people from Benjamin who, who committed the crime. Word soon reached the land of Benjamin that the other tribes had gone up to Mizpah. The Israelites then asked how this terrible crime had happened. The Levite The husband of the woman who had been murdered said, My concubine and I came to spend the night in Gibeah, a town that belongs to the people of Benjamin. That night, some of the leading citizens of Gibeah surrounded the house, planning to kill me. And they raped my concubine until she was dead. So I cut her body into 12 pieces and sent pieces throughout the territory assigned to Israel. For these men have committed a terrible and shameful crime. Now then, all of you, the entire community of Israel, must decide here and now what should be done about this. And all the people rose to their feet in unison and declared, none of us will return home. Not even one of us. Instead, this is what we would do to Gibeah. 
We will draw lots to decide who will attack it. One tenth of the men from each tribe will, cho- will be chosen to supply the warriors with food, and the rest will take us. Well, the rest of us will take refuge on Gib- revenge on Gibeah of the Benjamin for this shameful thing they have done in Israel. So all the Israelites were completely united. Somebody say completely united. And they gathered together to attack the town. The Israelites sent messengers to the tribe of Benjamin saying, what a terrible thing has been done among you. Give up those evil men, those troublemakers from Gibeah so we can execute them and purge Israel of this evil. But the people of Benjamin would not listen. Instead, they came from their towns and gathered at Gibeah to fight the Israelites. In all, 26,000 of their warriors armed with swords arrived to Gibeah to join the 700 elite troops who lived there. Among Benjamin's elite troops, 700 were left-handed, and each of them could sling a rock and hit a target with a hair's breadth without missing. Israel had 400,000. Somebody say 400,000. Israel had 400,000 experienced soldiers armed with swords, not counting Benjamin's warriors. Before the battle, here it is, before the battle, the Israelites went to Bethel. Bethel in Hebrew is Beth, means house. El means God. So they went to Bethel, the house of God, and asked God which tribe should attack the Benjamins first, the people of Benjamin first. The Lord answered, Judah is to go first. So the Israelites left the next morning and camped near Gibeah. Then they advanced towards towards Gibeah to attack the men of Benjamin. But Benjamin's warriors who were defending the town came out and killed 22,000 Israelites on the battlefield that day. But the Israelites encouraged each other and took their positions again the next day. This is the next day now. And they, as they, and they took their same place they had fought the previous day. For they had gone up to where Bethel, which means what? House of God. Somebody say house of God. And wept in the presence of the Lord until evening. They, had, they asked the Lord, should we fight against our relatives from Benjamin again? And the Lord said what? Go out and fight against them. So the next day they went out again to fight against the man of Benjamin. But the man of Benjamin killed another 18,000 Israelites. All who were experienced. This was just anybody. All of who were experienced with the sword. They taken out the best of them. Verse 26 says, Then all the Israelites went up to Bethel and wept in the presence of the Lord and fasted until evening. They also brought burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. The Israelites went up seeking direction from the Lord. In those days, the Ark of the Covenant of God was in Bethel. And Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the grandson of Aaron, was the priest. The Israelites asked the Lord, Should we fight against our relatives from Benjamin again? Look at this. Or should we stop? The Lord said, go, tomorrow I will hand them over to you. So the Israelites set an ambush all around Gibeah. They went out on the third day and took their positions at the same place as before. When the men of Benjamin came out to attack, they were drawn away from the town. And and as as they had done before, they began to kill the Israelites. About 30 Israelites died in the open fields and along the roads, one leading to Bethel. And to the other leading and the other leading back to Gibeah. Then the warriors of Benjamin shouted, We're defeating them as we did before. But the Israelites had planned in advance to run away so that the men of Benjamin would chase them along the roads and be drawn away from the town. When the main group of Israelites warriors reached Baal Tamar, they turned and took up their positions. Meanwhile, the Israelites hiding in the ambush to the west of Gibeah jumped up to fight. There were 10,000 elite Israelite troops who advanced Gibeah. The fighting was so heavy that Benjamin didn't even realize the impending disaster. So the Lord helped Israel defeat Benjamin that day. The Israelites killed 25,100 of Benjamin's warriors, all who were experienced swordsmen. Then the men of Benjamin saw that they were beaten. The Israelites had retreated from Benjamin's warriors in order to give those hiding in ambush more room to maneuver against Gibeah. Then those who were hiding rushed in from all sides and killed everyone in the town. They arranged to send up a large cloud of smoke from the town as a signal. 
When the Israelites saw the smoke, they turned and attacked Benjamin's warriors. By that time, Benjamin's warriors had killed about 30,000 Israelites, and they shouted, We defeated them as we did in the first battle. But when the warriors of Benjamin looked behind them and saw the smoke rising into the sky from every part of the town, the men of Israel turned and attacked. At this point, the men of Benjamin became terrified because they realized disaster was close at hand. So they turned around and fled before the Israelites toward the wilderness, but they could not escape the battle. And the people who came out of nearby towns also killed. So Israelites surrounded the men of Benjamin and chased them relentlessly, finally overtaking them east of Gibeah. That day, 18,000 of Benjamin's strongest warriors died in battle. The survivors fled into the wilderness towards the Rock of Rimon, but Israel killed 5,000 of them along there. They continued to chase until they killed another 2,000 near Gidom. So that day, the tribe of Benjamin lost 25,000 soldiers armed with swords, leaving only 600 men who escaped to the Rock of Rimon, where they lived for four months. And the Israelites returned and slaughtered every little thing, every living thing in the town. The people, the livestock, everything they found. And they also burned down the towns that they came to. So, obviously, the Israelites was under the Lord's command. And they went to fight. How many times did they fight the people of Benjamin? How many times did they lose that fight? And the third time they won. As we were reading this, some of you may have been thinking ahead, did you notice anything different between the third approach? Jonathan saw it. Anybody notice anything that was different? Or to you, or to you as well, you're listening and you're like, Lord, what's the takeaway here? What did you say? They fe- uh-huh. oh, the Lord said, I will give it to them. Deacon Marshall says they gave him an ambush. Jonathan said they fasted. They, there's a couple of things that I want to share with you that the Lord shared with me. Because I believe that there are times in life that the thing we're going after is not that it's outside of God's will for you. In fact, you're probably pursuing something that he, he spoke over your life or that you found in his word. But it seems like, Lord, I don't understand why I'm losing right now. My intentions are pure. What I'm believing you for, I don't think it's that outside of your will, your word promises it. So where's, what's, what's happening? Anybody ever felt that way before? What, what am I doing wrong? Amen? And I listened to this and I said, Lord, you got to help me here. And the first thing he showed me was in verse 26. Turn to, if, if you dare say Amen. Verse 26 says, then all the Israelites, this is the third time, went up to Bethel and wept in the presence of the Lord and fasted until evening. They also brought burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. Is that what your Bible says? The first thing they did is they consecrated themselves. So often we can just jump up. And go and do what we believe God has called us to do, but we didn't prepare ourselves first. The word consecrate actually comes from a Hebrew word called kadesh, which means to dedicate, to devote, to set apart, to be holy. Look at this last one, to prepare. Look at the life of Jesus. Jesus ministered to people on a daily basis. How often do you see in the Bible where it says early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus arose and went to pray. And then when he came back, that's when he went and and did what God had called them to do. Sometimes we have to prepare ourselves and consecrate ourselves before we step out and go do what God called us to do. Amen? You know, when you look at what fasting does, it also says they offered burnt offerings. According to Bible study tools in the Old Testament, God's people offered burnt offerings as a way of atonement. This is a way to say, Lord, forgive us for our wrongdoings. This is an outward expression of an apology to God. And the priests would have to take those burnt offerings and go into the most holy place and do this on behalf of the people. But does that mean that we stopped sinning? 
No, we, we sin every day, so the priest would have to do this regularly. But we have an advantage. Somebody say, we have an advantage. Come on, somebody say, we have an advantage. Because Jesus came and dealt with this sin problem for once and for all. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, for Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands. This is a comparison to the priest. He says, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on whose behalf? On our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again, like the high priest here on earth who enters into the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have, di have to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, somebody say, but now, once for all time, the Bible says he has appeared to the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice for us. Jesus offered himself. He was the perfect lamb of God. Amen? This wasn't animal blood. This was the blood of the lamb of God that broke the curse of sin, death, and the grave. Amen? And so back then they had to offer burnt offerings. Jesus himself offered himself unto us as a sacrifice. Come on, somebody say, Lord, I thank you. But what does that mean that even though he paid the price of our sin, does that mean now, okay, well, now we don't have to offer blood sacrifice to animals. Does that mean now we can live how we want to live and just do what we want to do since Jesus, uh, Jesus paid it all like the song says? Look what Paul reminds us of Romans 6. It says, well, then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become a slave of whatever you choose to obey. You can be a slave to sin, which leads to what? Or you can choose to obey God, which leads to what? Righteous living. The word righteous in Greek is dikaiosune, which means condition that is acceptable by God, consecrated. Amen? And so we're, we don't have to offer blood sacrifices. God died for us. We, but we know better that we don't try to take advantage or disregard the grace of God. So what do we do? Paul later says in Romans 12, let's read this together. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would do what? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Look at the word holy. What does that mean, word mean, Holy set apart, consecrated. So we have to present ourselves holy. We got to check ourselves before we go and try to engage the enemy. The children of Israel, they had 400,000. They had all the ingredients to win the battle, yet they were not consecrated. Every morning we got to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I know you've given me the victory. But Lord, purge me so that I can walk in the victory you died to give me. Clean me, Lord. What's Tasha Cobb saying in her song? Fill me up, God, till I overflow. I want to run over. Amen? Because the truth is, the Bible says in Romans 3, for all have sinned. And falling short of God's glory. God can't bless sin. Although this is promised for us to be blessed, we can't walk out in sin and expect that we're just going to win every battle, even though we're living any kind of way. Every morning we got to say, Lord, I thank you for see, helping me to see another night. I apologize for all the times I got it wrong yesterday. But I thank you, you've given me a chance to see a new day. Help me, Holy Spirit, to walk in the will of God. Order my steps in your word. Amen? Because God doesn't expect us to get it to be perfect, but he expects us to try. Amen? He expects us to try to live life the way he called us to live. Order my steps, Lord. I confess my sins to you, and I thank you for the blood that washes away my sins. The hymn says, sin has left a crimson stain, but he what? He washed it white as snow. 
Hallelujah. How many of you are thankful? Thankful for God, the perfect sacrifice of sin. We ought to offer ourselves, and we do this through prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. How often do we, do we when the Lord tells us, to go ahead and fast? Because sometimes he will tug us. You know, it's one thing to pray. It's another thing to pray and fast. Right? You remember when Jesus, he went up to the mountains to pray. And I believe it's in Matthew 10. I have it later in this ter- ter- sermon. And, and then the, the man with the demon-possessed boy, he brought him to Jesus' disciples. And they could not do anything for the little boy. But Jesus, who was a little away praying, he was consecrated. Amen? He was spending time with God. He came back and said, what seems to be the trouble here? The father says, we, my son has been troubled since birth. There's a spirit that's trying to kill him. It's throwing him into fire, into water. And I brought him to your disciples to pray. And they couldn't heal him. Jesus said, how long must I be with you? Bring the boy to me. All he said is leave him. Go. The boy fell down and began to seize and stood still. Everybody thought he was dead. And they helped him up. And Jesus didn't have to spend, exert much energy. Why? Because he came in full of the presence of God. Because he was consecrated. What a consecrate means? He was prepared. Amen? Amen. He was prepared. How many times have I stepped into a situation and forgot to prepare myself? Amen? We got to prepare ourselves. We are the temple of the living God. It says, present your bodies to God holy and acceptable to God. Amen? As a living sacrifice. Lord, let it be less of me and more of you. I see why Paul says, I boast now in my weakness. It's because when I'm weak, I'm really strong because God's strength is made perfect in my weakness. And so even though I may feel weak, I say, Lord, I'm still your vessel. And nothing is impossible with you. I prefer to, I prefer to do it in your strength than in mine. My strength may end. Amen? But the Bible says in Ephesians 6 and 10, it says that God, he says he's given us his strength. Amen? By his strength. And so, fasting is in the Bible actually over 40 times. But here's the thing when it comes to fasting. Fasting is what they say is the giving up of food, amen, for a period of time. Well, this is the problem because, you know, the world fasts too. In fact, you know, in, in, in the line of work when it comes to health and nutrition, they talk about intermittent fasting. You heard about that? So what's the difference between the world's fasting and ours? This is where we get it wrong sometimes. Fasting is not just giving something up. It's replacing it. Jesus would fast, but what would he do? He would go out and pray. In Matthew 4, the Bible says, and look how he prepared himself. He went and was baptized by John. Amen? You remember that? And, Jesus, and then the Bible says, the clouds opened up, and a dove descended and said, this is my dearly beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He's getting ready now to start his ministry because at this point, now the clock is ticking. His ministry lasted three years because he knew that his time would come, that he would fulfill the promise that he would die for our sins. And so the next thing after being baptized, he was going to choose his disciples. But before he did that, what did he do? He went to the wilderness and fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He prepared himself. He was consecrated. And the enemy saw it because the enemy knew trouble is coming. That's why the first thing the enemy tried to do was to get Jesus to, 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 to die. He told him, jump off this cliff. Because the word says that that he will give his angels charge over you. The enemy knew that that even though the Bible says Jesus was weak physically, he was consecrated and in the strength of God. Amen? He prepared himself for ministry. The Bible says in in Joshua chapter 3 that the people was getting ready to cross the, 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 um, the Jordan. Now the time had come for them to finally enter into the promised land. I think I, did I include that in here? They were finally getting ready to enter into the promised land. And 
in Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, they were getting ready to cross the Israelite, and God instructed Joshua. He says, Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourself. Guess what another word for sanctify means? Somebody say it out loud. To consecrate. Someone else said something? Prepare? It's, it's the same thing. Sanctify yourself, consecrate yourself, prepare yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. God is going to do wonders among you, but make sure you are prepared. Make sure you are positioned. Amen? So I want to share something with you. And if you're taking notes, this was the first thing that was different, is that they consecrated themselves before they went back to battle. I was reading and I was, um, you know, just doing my studies and it talked about the five fasting and prayer, five ways fasting and prayer can change your life. All right. Number one, let's say it together. Fasting and prayer can do what? It reveals our hidden sin. Amen. Because now you, get to, you begin to see clearly. I mean, if you ever fasted before and it was tough the first day or two. And then now you're getting into the groove of things and all of a sudden you just seem like you're extra sharp in your mind. Like you can hear the, the God's voice. Amen? I said it before, and I don't know if I clarified it. Fasting is not just giving something up. It's replacing it. That means whatever you're giving up, what you would normally do, you now spin with in, the, in the presence of God. Amen? Some of you, it may not be food. I know some people who, who they can wake up and go through their whole day and not eat until 4 o'clock, and they're fine. So the fasting for food may not be for them. Maybe it's fasting from social media, fasting from their phone. Maybe it's fasting from watching. They, 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 may, not, they may not eat, but they'll get up and binge watch shows until it's time for them to go to work. So maybe it's fasting from TV. I know for me, fasting for food is always a sacrifice. If I get up and not eat until four, you, I would look like I'm about to die. So we, we say, if pastor say, skip a meal or two, I say, well, he said a meal first. <laughs> <laughs> or not the, I don't know about the or two, Lord. You got to help me with that. Amen? And so that's, that's for me. You know what a sacrifice is for you. Amen? And so fasting can, can, can reveal our hidden sin. What does number two say? Fasting and prayer can do what? Strengthen your intimacy with God. How many of you experienced that before? Where you fasted and all of a sudden you just felt like you were so close to God. When, and before, when you were in your flesh, you're trying to read the Bible, and you can only go two minutes. Two minutes felt like 20 minutes. But then when you're fasting and you're close with God, you're like, oh, my gosh, it's time for me to leave. I, I'm not done here. Me and God is just getting started. Amen. Anybody have experienced that before? It can in strengthen your intimacy, intimacy with God. What about number three? Fasting and prayer can do what? Teach us to pray with the right motives. We can pray but we could pray with the wrong motives. That's why Jesus had to teach us how to pray. We saw prayer. When Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, he used an illustration on people who were praying with the wrong motives. He says, don't be like the Sadducees and Pharisees who pray out openly so that people can see. They got their reward. But when you pray, you go in your private place, and God who sees what you've done privately will reward you openly. They pray with the wrong motives. Pray with the right motives. Make sure your will is in aligned with the will of God. Amen? Because guess what? If your will is aligned with the will of God, then it's guaranteed to happen for you. Because the Bible says, not a word of the Lord shall return unto him void. Are we praying with the right motives? Next one, praying, fasting and prayer can do what? It can build our faith. We just talked about it with the, the young boys when they, when they said, Lord, how come when we prayed, it didn't happen for us? The kid still was demon-possessed. What, what did we do wrong? Jesus said, because of your what? Your unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you would say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. What it says, nothing will what? However, this kind does not go out except Jesus was consecrated. That demon had to flee. It had to flee. Because fasting does help build your faith. Amen? And the next one is going to lead to the second key. Fasting and prayer does what? It helps us to hear from God. Say that one more time. Fasting and prayer does what? 
So the first key, when you're going through a battle and you feel like you're not seeing any movement and you got to go back and retrace your steps, make sure you're doing things the right thing, right way, what's the first thing you can do? I didn't hear anybody. I heard one scholar in the back. <laughs> Consecrate yourself. Consecrate yourself. You know, I want to share one thing that I heard someone saying was powerful. Fasting is, you, you don't manipulate God with fasting. Fasting doesn't move God. Fasting moves you. It moves you to now be in a place where you can hear from God and receive his instructions so that you can experience victory in your life. Amen? When we're so much in our flesh, we are influenced by any and everything. But when you consecrate yourself, now you're going back to the drawing boards. And you say, Lord, what do you have to say on this matter? That's my promise there. Amen? And so, number one, you consecrate yourself. Number two, look at verse 27. Verse 21 7 says, you see it there? It says, the Israelites went up seeking direction. Somebody say seeking direction. Seeking direction from the Lord. They went up and sought direction. And as a result of that, now they had a plan. Deacon Marshall was right. You see, sometimes we can know that God has something for us, but we go about it the way we want to go about it. Amen? Amen? Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on what? Your own understanding. In all your ways, do what? Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And sometimes it's not that it's not God's promise for you. Sometimes you just don't give him a chance to show you how it should be done. They sought direction. You know what else consecration does for you? It causes you to humble yourself. Because now you got to crucify your flesh. Why do you think when you're fasting, your flesh fights back? Because you're putting your flesh back under submission. And so you're humbling yourself now. And because you've humbled yourself, now you can hear from God. And now he can give you instructions on what to do about that situation you're facing. Amen? How do I know that they had a plan? We'll go down to verse 32. Look what verse 32 says. It says, then the warriors of Benjamin shouted, we're defeating them as we did before. But the Israelites had planned what? In advance to run away so that men and Benjamin can chase them. So they came out to fight and they saw that the other army was experiencing battle. And so they had a plan. We're going to be here. I love it. We're going to be here. They had ambushes waiting. So we're going to fight them. Then we're going to retreat. They're, all their experienced soldiers are going to chase us and say, we are, we are defeating them as we did before, not knowing that they were being led away from the town they were defending. And so when they led them away, that's when those who were waiting on the sides got up, entered into the town, and took siege of the town. And then that's when they, they said that it would, they would do what as a signal to demonstrate the town has been taken over. They would rise up clouds of smoke. And so when they saw the smoke, the Israelites saw the smoke, they saw that part of the plan was completed. Now it's time to fight. And now they're fighting, and the, and the, and the people from Benjamin is fighting, and somebody looks back, and they see that their precious town is going up in flames. That's when they realized they were defeated. Because there was a plan. Oftentimes, we'll get a plan after we come out of fasting or in fasting. Amen? And I'm sometimes, because you can hear what it says, you can hear clearly from God. You can pray with the right motives. Amen? And so when you're fasting, you know, Sue and I, that's what we do. We're praying and we're fasting. And it's, it's almost every time when we're believing God for something, we say, God, we don't understand what we need to do about this situation. We tried everything, and it's not working. And we, we, can, we both sense it. It happens just like this. I can feel it, and I'm at work, and I hear the Lord saying, you should do a fast. You should consecrate yourself. I'm talking to Sue, and she, she will hear it separately as well. So we know, all right, well, that's confirmation. And so we begin to pray and fast, and almost always, right, Sue Ann? We, we would both land on something, and it was like, wow, 
Sometimes the answer is in front of you the whole time. You just couldn't see it in your flesh. Because the enemy had influence to blind your eyes. But the moment you consecrate yourself and the blinders are removed, all of a sudden there's a plan. Amen? What did, what did Elisha pray over his servant when the servant went outside and saw that they were surrounded? In his flesh, he said, Lord, he came back to, to, to Elisha and said, Master, we are completely surrounded. But Elisha was consecrated. He prayed his hands on his servant and said, Lord, open his eyes. And that's when he went back out and saw that the same army that had them surrounded was surrounded by the armies of chariots of fire. And that's when Elisha says, there is more on our side than there is on theirs. They both were in the same situation, but they both had two vantage points. Why? Because one of them was consecrated. One of them could see that, trust me, I'm not alone. God is on my side. There is more for me than there is against me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. All those realities of God's scripture only comes to life when you're in a position to receive and believe it. But as long as you're walking by sight and not by flesh, I mean not by faith, then you're liable to believe whatever is right in front of you. But when you walk by faith and not by sight, it's a brief segue. I, know you, I told you guys about my father when he was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. And the doctor told my mom, and she waited to tell us that she, he doesn't have much time left. Amen? And she told us at Josh's fourth birthday, he was, I, I, Sue, you remember this? It was as clear as day. It was at Sue's mom's house. It was a pool party. Everybody was walking into the back, and she was like, I'm so sorry to tell you this at this occasion, but it's, you know, it's, it's to have, this is one of the few times we can have everybody there at the same time. And she said, the doctor said that your father is diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. He went and got his scan. It was prostate cancer, but by that time, it metastasized into his spine, into his brain, everywhere. And he told us to prepare ourselves. And we stood there, and I see why the Lord is making this connection, because this was not part of the sermon. We stood there, and we kind of looked, and it was quiet for, it felt like it was only, it, it was only 30 seconds, but it felt like it was like five minutes. Because we all just kind of looked at each other. And they're like, so what are we going to do? And then my older brothers, and I feel like someone else said it at the same time. They said, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. And not only are we going to pray, the very next day we started a fast as a family. We had to do it because what the doctors were saying, the evidence was right in front of us. They had the scans. But when you consecrate yourself, the word of God becomes more real to you than anything or anybody can say. What did the Bible say? What did the scripture say? Let God be true and every man be a lie. Hallelujah. When you make God's word more real than the reality that's in front of you, nothing that comes against you can stand. If God be for you, who can be against you? The doctor had the nerve to tell my mom, they said, my mom said, you know, we're going to pray. My dad, you, you hear him preach, he's bold. He says whatever's on his mind. And he says, my God is going to heal me. The doctor says, I heard that before. Plan your funeral. I heard that before. That's what he said. We fasted as a family. It was a three-day fast we did. He had another appointment the following week. Then the people began to pray. Church began to pray. And I remember, as we were consecrating ourselves, our smiles began to come back. We, he didn't have his follow-up yet. But our, what it says, fasting does what? Builds your what? It builds your faith. All of a sudden, we just started to experience peace. Hebrews 4 says, do not, be cons do not worry, but in everything, what, by prayer and supplication, make your requests be known unto God. Then you will experience the peace of God. Then, that surpasses all understandings. Though you're still in the situation, there's peace that lets you know it's going to be good on the other side. It surpasses all understandings. And the Bible says the peace will guard your heart and mind. So in the situation, he didn't have his follow-up yet, but we had the peace of God. Why? We were consecrated. Our eyes opened. We were like Elisha, not the servant. Before we were like the servant, we consecrated ourselves, and we say, no, God's word proved true. He is not a man that he should lie. 
Hallelujah. I remember, and so I love how God does things. The same doctor was in the room for my dad's follow-up. And he's, he walks in, and he's looking at the scan. He's flipping it upside down, looking at it sideways. He walks out of the room, come back with other oncologists, and they're all standing in a circle. Now, my dad, being the preacher, he's sitting on the bed and said, what are you looking at? You don't have to look anymore. I'll tell you what happened. The God that I said would heal me, healed me. He didn't have to look at the scan. The oncologist came back and pulled my parents aside. Look at this, because we, we have to be careful too. We can be bold in God, but we don't have to offend people. Because there can always be a door to welcome them to the body of Christ. The oncologist came and pulled them aside and was like, I'm sorry, you know, for how I was. But found out the reason why he was as hard in his heart as he was is because his dad has cancer. And he felt, as a, as a doctor, he felt helpless. Like he couldn't do anything for his own dad. So his heart became hard. Now he's asking them, what did you guys do? He didn't know he just opened the door for a 45-minute sermon. And he had my mom and my dad in the same room. I felt bad for his ears. He probably went through a whole praise and worship, altar call, everything. But they, they ministered to him and encouraged him because they were consecrated. They could have very easily believed what was being told to them. But Wes, what did we say about red words? Red words win. When you read through the Bible, all of Jesus' words are in what color? Red words win. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. I need somebody to give God praise. Red words win. The promises of God for your life is yes and amen. And if God said it, he can do it. I heard someone say, if you have enough faith to pray it, God has enough power to do it. Red words win. I believe God is helping somebody this morning. Because that was not in the notes, but I had to share it. Because I forgot we even fasted. We consecrated ourselves. After you consecrate yourself, you come out with a plan. Now, see, you have to be able to believe God and follow his instructions. My father knew that the Lord healed him. In fact, I told you that this was Josh's 14th birthday. Josh, please stand just for a quick moment. Just stand up. I'm sorry. It was his fourth birthday that this happened. So Josh, please, does Josh look like he's still four? Stand up, Josh. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Gabs was on him. Josh, how old are you now? He's 16. And that my father has not had another note from the doctor saying otherwise. Hallelujah. But he had to start following God's instructions about his health and things he had to do. See, there's a plan that came out of the consecration. You got to follow that plan. God can perform miracles, but you have a part in your own miracle. Amen. They had a plan. I'm going to speed up now. Um, but this is just the word plan in the Bible, I'm sorry, in Webster's Dictionary is defined several ways. And I see, and this is very instrumental. To have a plan is to have a specific intention. Amen? A intention or design about what is going to be done. To have a plan, you have to make a decision that you're going to follow that plan. And the decision on how you're going to arrange it, when? In the moment? In advance. When you have a plan, you have a what? A detailed proposal. You're not just winging it. You're saying, God, show me what to do. And you write it down. Make sure you write it down. And it's a detailed proposing, a proposal for doing or achieving something. A plan is a what? A method. It's a method for achieving an end result. Last one, look at this. A plan is detailed formulation of a program of what? This takes us into the last one, and I'm going to close here. Number one, what do you do when you believe in God for something? You, you, you're going to do what? You consecrate yourself. You prepare yourself. 
you set yourself apart. Amen? Number two, in your consecration, you're asking God to reveal his what? His plan. We can toss our plan aside. God, what is your plan? And number three, after that, is that you actually step out in faith and carry out that plan. Some of us are still stuck on two. We've been praying. We've consecrated ourselves. God's given us an answer. He's told us what to do. And the moment we're getting ready to step out, fear comes in. And fear can paralyze you. That you won't even step out. Some of you already have the plans to the business. Some of you already have the plans to the ministry. Some of you already have the plans to whatever it is God's called you out to do. On the job, maybe in your home. The next thing you need is action. You got to step out. Amen? Look what the Bible says about faith. The Bible says faith without works is what? So you can say you have faith, but the question is, where's your works? Look what Paul says. It says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? In verse 18 it says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith how? By my works. You will know where my faith is just by the way I walk. By the way I talk. Amen? How many people you heard someone say, oh, I'm going to do this and this and this, until now you never seen them go out after it? I'm believing God for my breakthrough. I'm believing God for my, for my, for that he's going to help me get a job, and yet there's no action or works to go along with it. Paul says, I will show you my faith by my works. Amen. Verse 21, it says, was not Abraham our father justified, justified by works? When he offered Isaac his son on the altar, do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made what? Perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness as he was called what? Because he had faith and his faith was accompanied by works. I don't know what God is calling you to do. I don't know what you believe in God for. What area in your life do you feel def deflated, def deflated or defeated? I'm going to ask the musicians to come forward. Maybe it was just our approach. I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm criticizing myself. I said, Lord, I needed to hear this. I could have I read that chapter and just been confused and moved on. It wouldn't be the first time I read something in the Bible that I didn't understand. But I said, no, I sought the Lord, and he began to speak to me. He said, son, it's not in me not being able to do it for you. Sometimes you're just taking the wrong approach. You're not prepared. You didn't consecrate yourself. You, you don't have my plan. You have your plan. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, for I know the plans that I have for you. But I was walking by my plans. And number three, there was no actions. I believed it. The Bible said it. But where was my faith? Amen? I believe God is speaking to somebody this morning. Because as I said, as I was preparing the sermon, I've, I've, I've said, Lord, in whatever area in the life of your people, and I'm asking you all to stand up, that maybe they feel defeated or deflated. Wherever they felt stagnant or they felt like they was just other areas, things are going well, but it's just this one thing that they just, just can't seem to get past. Whatever it is, Lord, set them free this morning. Close your eyes and lift your hands. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for speaking to us, God. Helping us to check ourselves to make sure our approach is right. Lord God, I thank you for speaking to us and letting us know that sometimes we just don't prepare ourselves the way we should. We can't hear your voice because we didn't take time to consecrate ourselves. And the moment we do that, that's when we can come out with a plan and your way in doing it. Maybe we're going about it all wrong, but after today, in the name of Jesus... 
as your children begin to consecrate themselves and seek your face, that, God, that you will reveal to them your plans for their lives. And, God, as their, as their faith is demonstrated through actions, whatever was stuck, we command to be open now in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you now for breakthroughs. We thank you for testimonies. Lord God, build up their faith. Oh, God, cover their minds. Grant them peace and let them know it's not over yet. Maybe it didn't happen before us in the past. But, Lord, thank you for speaking to us today because now we have another chance to see your will be done in our lives. If there's anyone in here with all head bows and eyes closed that's in this place and you said, you know what, I, I, I am not even in a relationship with God. I don't know him as my personal Lord and Savior. I never invited him to my life to be my Savior and Lord. I've never spoken those words. But, Lord, I feel like you're speaking to me today. Remember, we just said in a baptismal pool that God is the good shepherd, that he'll leave the 99 to go after the one. And when the one comes home, all of heaven rejoice. Maybe someone today is the one, and you feel like God has left the 99, and he's tugging at your heart. And you know that it is God pulling on you. And today you want to give him your life to be your Savior and Lord. If that's you with all head bows and all his eyes closed, I'm just going to ask that you raise your hand. If that's you, you want to give your life to the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. I see those hands. If you want to give your life to God this morning and invite him to be your Savior and Lord, hallelujah, I see those hands. We're going to pray this prayer together. Even if you're in this place and you've given your life to the Lord and you, 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 you strayed, you're not where you was with God. And you feel like there's a distance between you and God. And you want things to be restored to how it was when you first gave your life to God. And today, today I want to rededicate my life to God. If that's you, just lift your hands right where you are. With every head bow, every eye closed. Amen. With those head bows and those eyes closed, if you just raise your hand, I want to pray a prayer with you. And this is the prayer of salvation. This is what changes everything. The, the Bible said that once you, once you give your life to God and confess your life to him, he, your name is written in the Lamb book of life. And what God writes, no man can erase. This day is going to change everything for you. So as every head bow and every eye closed, if you raise their hand, I just want you to meet me right here at the altar. I'm going to pray this prayer with you. Just come forward. Just come on forward. Come on, come on, just come forward. Don't wait. Just come forward. I want to pray. I want to pray with you. Can someone help her? Hallelujah. If you prayed that prayer, just come forward. Hallelujah. If you want to give your life to the Lord for your very first time, if you want to rededicate your life, just come forward in the name of Jesus. Come on, there's still time. Don't let the moment pass you by. Don't let this moment pass you by. If that's you and you want to say, Lord, I, I want to give my life to Jesus. Hallelujah. Just come to me. I want to pray this prayer with you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says in the book of Romans that if we confess our sins to God and ask him to come into our lives, that we shall be saved. Because it is with our hearts that we believe and are justified. And it is with our mouth we confess our faith and are saved. It's as easy as A, B, C. A, we admit that we are a sinner and that we sin against God. B, we believe that Jesus died on the cross for those sins. And C, we confess, open up our mouths and confess him as Savior and Lord. And so I want all those who have come forward, if there's still room, don't let your moment pass you by if you want to come forward. Hallelujah. And if you, if you want to come forward and rededicate your life and give your life to the Lord, just come to us now. But I'm going to ask those who have come forward to pray this prayer with me. And if you are... I want you to pray this prayer with me. And, and for those of you all in this room, just let's say this together. Nice and loud. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I, admit I admit that I'm a sinner. I, a sinner. I, believe I believe that you died for me. Died for me. Thank, you Thank you for giving your life for me. For your life for right, now, right now, I confess, I confess you to be my Lord and Savior. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Be my Lord and Savior. From this day forward. From this day forward. 
I am yours and you are mine. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Let's celebrate this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, brother. God bless you, brother. We just want to get some information from you, my sister.